writer, so I write it all down. <laughs> went to the other auditorium, it was much smaller, I got discouraged. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks everybody for showing up. Yes, it is his real chest. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me to speak to you today. I must state at the outset that I typically read and watch very little science fiction, though I love Jules Verne and his unscientific but likewise presciently entertaining rival, H.G. Wells. Also the sci-fi novels of Arthur Conan Doyle, especially the ones like The Lost World featuring Professor George Edward Challenger, a name to conjure with battling dinosaurs. On my website, I describe myself as a storyteller, not a novelist, screenwriter, or film director. I have never much distinguished between medium or subject. I don't care if my stories are funny or serious historical or futuristic. I don't care whether they are movies or books or TV series, though their content may suggest which medium shoots, suits them best. I just want them to be good stories. Someone asked me what was my definition of a good story and I responded, it's a story that once you've heard it, you understand why I wanted to tell him. Joseph Conrad wrote, my aim above all is to make you see. I tell stories, the purpose of which is to make people laugh or cry in a word to make them feel. And if at the end of what is meant to be an emotional journey, you wind up thinking about what you have felt, so much the better. But before we go any further, there are three caveats. Firstly, I'd like to observe that artists lose all proprietary authority over their works when they are finished. Artists put messages in bottles and toss them into life's ocean, hoping someone will find and decode them but chances are we won't be around in every instance of discovery to say, you're right, you're wrong, that's not gun, that's gum, etc. <laughs> when and if they do. The artist's opinion by this point is just another opinion. People will make of works of art what they will, they always have. In short, I am not the answer to a book of math equations at the back. I can perhaps say what I intended, or attempted, or thought I was trying to accomplish, but not what any of it means to each of you. My second caveat is this, that like magic tricks when once explained, an artist's answers tend to disappoint. Art, and science too for all I know, is much more interesting posing questions than answering them. As you may gather, this, if I have anything to say about it, is going to be a talk about ideas. Answers may be few, but perhaps the questions will hold your attention. Thirdly, and lastly, writers are liars. That's why Plato didn't want us in his republic. <laughs> if we can't supply what you want to know, we make up shit. <laughs> Take, for example, Poe's philosophy of composition. How many people have read the philosophy of composition? So forgive the rest of you. Have to forgive me if I go through it. Poe was asked, you know, how he created stuff, or he said he was asked. 
So he said, I'm going to explain how I wrote my most famous poem, The Raven. And he said, it was nothing but logic, pure logic. First, I decided I wanted to write a poem. Second, what his first, next consideration is, what should be the length of the poem? He says, I have never written novels and never written epics because I believe that a work of art to be appreciable should be digestible at a, city, at a single sitting. He faults Paradise Lost because you can't get it in one go. So he wanted it to be a short poem, a hundred lines. The Raven is 108. Next, what is the subject of the poem? It is my conviction, says Poe, that the proper province of poetry is the contemplation of the beautiful. Everything else is prose. So I now have a hundred line poem about something beautiful. What is the greatest beauty in Poe's opinion? Sad beauty. I now had a hundred line poem about something sad. What is the saddest beauty that Poe could imagine? Death. Whose death is the saddest that he could imagine? The death of a maiden. I now have a 100 line poem about the death of a maiden. At this point, Poe says, I wanted to have a chorus, a refrain, a stanza, something, a phrase, maybe even a word. What's the saddest word you could think of? Nevermore. Now we've got a hundred line poem about the death of a maiden, and the answer is nevermore. And by the way, it is an answer. So somebody's asking questions. That's a no-brainer. Must be the lover of the dead girl. We now have a hundred and eight line poem about the death of a maiden with the lover asking questions to which the remorseless and implacable answer Nevermore. That is kind of repetitive, almost not quite human. So he thought, you know, maybe it's a parrot. Maybe he's talking to a parrot. But he said, a, a parrot is a comical bird. It didn't have the right, hmm, and uh, I don't know what that word, how you spell that word. Uh, so he said, but then he remembered that ravens could mimic human speech. Now we have a hundred line poem, the death of a maiden, the lover asking questions of the raven. And now you start to understand something of the perverse psychology of the lover, who is clearly always framing his answers, knowing that he only can get one useful answer from the raven, which is never more, never more, never more. And then finally the question, how do you put the lover and the raven together? First he thought of doing it in the woods, the raven's milieu, but that seemed to lack the voluptuous, claustrophobic intensity that he was after. So he put the lover in his study, and the raven tapping at his chamber door, etc. Now it seems to me there's four possibilities here. One, this is how Poe wrote the raven. Two, this is how he thinks he wrote the raven. Three, this is how he wishes he'd written the raven. <laughs> and four, this is how he would like you to think he wrote the raven. What is the answer? I don't know, but I figure it's probably some amalgam of all of these things and difficult to pin down. Hence my caution that you know, writers are liars and you know, Gilbert said he got the idea to write the Mikado because a Japanese sword that was hanging over his desk fell down and almost decapitated him, gave him the idea for the Mikado. It's a good story, it may even be true. It simply does not explain how he wrote the Mikado. <laughs> Leo Tolstoy, the author of my favorite novel, War and Peace, once stated that the purpose of art is to teach us to love life. No matter how beautiful or terrible, I think Tolstoy is right, the bottom line function of art is to infatuate us with life. Parenthetically, one must acknowledge that art can have other functions. Art can teach us about life. It can help us to endure. 
or even briefly to escape life. But for today, let's stick with love because the sun will set at some point. If the purpose of art is to teach us to love life, Star Trek, it seems to me, totally fills the bill. Granted, it is more fiction than science, but I think many devotees first became interested in the universe by responding to Star Trek's message about life, its variety, its value, and as Spock would say, its possibilities. Tolstoy quibbled with Shakespeare. He said, to be or not to be is not the question. We're here. The question is now what? <laughs> Isn't that also a Star Trekian question? I am a slow reader, a slow thinker, and a slow understander. It may come as a surprise that when Star Trek was first telecast shortly after the Civil War, <laughs> I was not among its adherents. I saw a lot of folks running around cheesy sets, wearing what looked like Dr. Denton's, and a man with pointy ears. I never stuck around to find out more. It was many years later in Hollywood when a friend working at Paramount Pictures encouraged me to meet with Harv Bennett, who'd been assigned to produce the second Star Trek feature film. Harv, a remarkable man, who had produced a great deal of television, including Mod Squad and The Six Million Dollar Man, and perhaps more importantly, the first big time miniseries, Rich Man, Poor Man, had never made a feature film. But we got along very well. Harv showed me Star Trek the motion picture. Many people are pleased to knock this film, but I am not among them. Robert Wise went boldly where no film had gone before. If he made mistakes along the way, I would learn from them. But at the same time, Star Trek depicted a world I didn't understand and a philosophy to which I was unable to subscribe. Other than technology, I see scant evidence the human condition has changed. It would take me years in my own involvement with the Star Trek world to change my views about the series and to understand or to start to understand what it was trying to accomplish. But Harv persisted and made me watch several of the original television episodes which proved more absorbing than I had anticipated. I began to perceive striking innovations in the show, things I'd originally failed to notice while channel surfing. The unprecedented melting pot, the multinational cast, the daring first televised interracial kiss, the show's willingness to confront and grapple with social issues that by setting them in a sci-fi context allowed viewers to contemplate subject matter that if set on Earth might push so many bias buttons that shackled by our prejudices we could never contemplate such topics objectively. The best science fiction, it seems to me, and I'm sure this isn't news to you, whether set in the past, the future, or outer space, seems always to reflect the human condition of the time in which it was created, like all art. Predicting the future, whether in life or via what we term science fiction, is a tricky business, and most prognosticators, professional and amateurs, get it wrong. True, Star Trek got cell phones, right? Who could have foreseen Donald Trump? <laughs> Science fiction always winds up depicting the time in which it was made, rather the time in which it is supposedly set. R. Bennett had promised that draft five of the script of Star Trek II would arrive imminently. I waited, and I waited. It was three or four weeks later that I woke up and found myself wondering what had become of the script that Harv had promised to send. 
I called him and found him embarrassed. He said, kid, you know what's going on, kid? What was the time when it was? Uh, he said, I can't show you this book. What he said was, my tits in a ringer. I had never heard that before. <laughs> I said, so that's draft five. Well, what about draft four or draft three? And he said, kid, you don't get it. These five drafts are simply separate attempts to get another Star Trek movie out of this. They're not related. And by this time, I'm jonesing to make a space opera. And so I said, well, can you send them up to me? And in those days, you didn't hit send. <laughs> a van drives up. <laughs> and as I said, I'm a slow reader. So I waded through all these scripts. And then I had what I thought was a brainstorm and invited Harv and his producing partner, Robert Salem, come to my house, and I, and I had a, a yellow a legal pad, and I said, I have an idea. Um, why don't we sit here and make a list of all the things we like in these five scripts? Could be a major plot, it could be a subplot, it could be a sequence, it could be a scene, it could be a character, it could be a line of dialogue, I don't care. Let's make the list. And then, let me try to combine all the things we like into one script. I thought, well, I thought this was really smart, and they, they didn't seem happy. <laughs> and I said, what's the matter with my idea? And they said, well, unless we have a script in 12 days, Industrial Light and Magic, which is the special effects house, cannot guarantee delivery of the shots in time for the June opening which, P.S., I think was today or tomorrow. And um, I said, what, what do you know for me? And they said, oh, yeah, the picture is booked into 600. <laughs> he said, what? Wait a minute. You, 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 you booked the movie into theaters and there's no movie? <laughs> and he said, well, that's the way it's always done. <laughs> so I said, okay, okay, okay. Um, listen, I think I can do this in 12 days, but we've got to get on with it. We've got to pick the things that we like. Um, and they still didn't look happy. And I said, well, now what's the problem? He says, the problem is we couldn't even make your deal in 12 days. And at this point, and I've had a lot of time to reflect on what happened next. <laughs> I, said, I said, look, forget about my deal, forget about the money, forget about the credit. I'm already going to be the director, we know that, that's a done deal. But if we don't do this now, there's not going to be a movie. What are you saying? You know, later when I told my agent this, he said this was the time when he realized that the priesthood was not a career for which he was cut out. <laughs> which he had contemplated at one point, because he wanted to kill me. <laughs> anyway, I don't remember anything about the 12 days, but it was like fiddling with a Rubik's Cube. And I just went, and, and basically, I would say 80, 85% of the dialogue was mine, about 15% of it was ours, and somehow we cobbled this thing together. Thus began my first Star Trek film. It's proper, I think, to point out that following my directing debut, time after time, was a book. This was only my second film, but inexperienced as I was, I was already forming theories about what kind of director I wanted to be. It seems to me that all artistic media leave something to the imagination. Paintings don't move. Music has no intellectual content. And printed words are merely coded symbols the brain must decipher. The painting moves when it meets your eye. Beethoven becomes profound when it hits your ear. 
Otherwise, it is merely catgut and tubing, a collage of organized sounds. Words make us laugh or cry when our brains decipher their letter combinations and juxtapositions. In each case, it is the imaginative contribution of the viewer, the listener, the reader, that completes the work of art. If we directors aren't careful, movies alone, and I include all forms of television, have the hideous capacity to do everything for you, to leave nothing to your imagination. We call this eye candy, and candy is not good for you. By showing you everything, the movie can lock you out of the experience, rendering you passive while the film does everything for you. You are not permitted to make your imaginative contribution that completes the experience by making you part of it. You're talking to the man who fell asleep in both versions of Blade Runner. <laughs> <laughs> As a director, I am always in search of what I can leave out. Just because somebody points to something in a movie doesn't mean you have to show what they pointed to. You can raise suspense mightily if we prolong or never show it. Horror movies have long understood this. Victims' eyes widen with shock or repulsion at something we cannot see. Our imaginations are forced to grapple with what it might be. I might note at this point that imagination needs little or no training or prompting. Just listen to commercials on the radio and see how automatically we are able to envision the ring around the collar, as described by the exasperated housewife. Radio, incidentally, is a great artistic medium, depriving the auditor of sight and forcing our ears to work overtime. Radio plays are totally immersive artistic experiences. In addition to omitting things and leaving them to your imaginations, as a director, I subscribe to the idea that form should, to some extent, be predicated on content. The aesthetic choices an artist makes should reflect the material at hand. A director's style, in other words, should be subordinate to the demands of the story. If you are filming a gothic tale set in a vast, mysterious mansion, for example, a fluid, gliding camera may best serve your narrative needs. Conversely, a story set in the confines of a coal mine may prompt the director to think in terms of static, sweat-stained close-ups. For Star Trek, with my nautical associations, and I had always likened Star Trek to the Captain Horatio Hornblower books that I read when I was a kid, I thought, well, this is like Hornblower in outer space. How many people here have read the Hornblower books? Come on, come on. Um, C.S. Forrester, the guy who wrote The African Queen, he wrote the, and, and, and uh, Hornblower was a, captain in the Royal Navy during the Napoleonic Wars, and he had a girl in every port, and if you're 13, that kind of sounds good. Um, <laughs> and he had lots of adventures, and I thought, okay, so Star Trek is, is hornblower in outer space. So um, I was like having nautical associations. I was imagining battleships in space, or perhaps even better, submarines. The notion of claustrophobic spaces seemed best to me, especially when contrasted with the infinity outside those ships. I didn't much care for the previous Star Trek spaceship interiors, which seemed more like the carpeted corridors of a Holiday Inn than a functioning spacecraft. There wasn't much I could do about the cavernous Enterprise bridge set, which I inherited along with other pieces of the previous film, but I did attempt to add a lot of blinking lights I wanted everything to be as nautical as possible. I wanted cramped spaces like on real warships with lots of instruments and glowing dials. I tried to make things more authentic. For example, in Star Trek VI, I experimented with the absence of gravity. 
as I'd seen it on film shot aboard the space station. I also attempted to remove the sound of spaceships, since in space there's no sound, but that didn't work. When you remove their roar, Enterprise and Reliant looked like what they were, models. But I did insist that inside the ship, there was always an engine throbbing somewhere, the heartbeat of the ship. Writing the screenplay, certain questions I felt had to be addressed, not the least of which was, how do people talk in the future? I don't know about you, but lots of times in movies I'm disappointed by the way characters express themselves. The filmmakers go to extraordinary lengths to get the look right, whether it be medieval England or ancient Rome, the sets and the costumes are authentic down to the last detail. And then the characters open their mouths, hey dude, let's do this. <laughs> and the total effect is ruined. All that authenticity down the drain, the Romans might as well be wearing Fitbits. <laughs> Starting with the formal and relentlessly logical Mr. Spock, what language needed to be employed? Unlike the freewheeling Star Wars series, which made no pretense to being related to planet Earth that takes place, you know, a long time ago in a galaxy far away. I'm missing a page here. Um, a brief pause for station <laughs> anyway, I was looking. It's not even here. Um, I was looking for a kind of an exalted language. Um, Spock already speaks in a slightly exalted language, and I was looking for something. I suppose you would say Shakespearean, something like that. And once you get into Shakespeare, Moby Dick is not far behind, because obviously Herman Melville was a fan. And the thing about Moby Dick and Shakespeare is they're not in copyright. <laughs> True. Maybe I didn't write as much of that script as I think. <laughs> in that tale, Captain Ahab, like Khan, defying all logic and reason, seeks vengeance on the creature that maimed him. But for Ahab, Moby Dick is not a dumb beast, but a mask for something entirely unnatural and malign. Know ye, Starbuck, that all things in this world are but as pasteboard masks. It is the thing behind the mask I chiefly hate, he tells his appalled first mate. Talk not to me, talk not to me of blasphemy, man. I'd strike the sun if it insulted me. Ahab rails to which Star Trek responds, I have seen madmen, I've seen a madman beget madmen. This also sounds very timely lately. Who could he possibly be talking about today? Note the language, we might call it Shakespearean, it is written in iambic pentameter the ideal meter for English, and it is, for want of a better term, poetic. Melville was also clearly a Shakespeare fan. Given all my associations thus far and my goals, it seemed fitting to borrow Shakespeare via Herman Melville to give the characters in Star Trek a language with which to express themselves. Knowing how to folks will speak 200 years from now, or even if there will be any folks to speak at the rate we're going. But taking my cue from Nabokov, I thought it a good idea to invent a language for them, an exalted language. After all, these movies are typically referred to as space operas. Therefore, it seemed fitting, to me at least, that their dialogue be operatic, that they be granted arias. Whether we're talking about Richard III or Hamlet, you can't beat their dialogue. But after three films, I still hadn't gleaned all Star Trek had to teach me. It may seem strange how long it took me to understand that while adding submarines or battleships 
might have enabled me to create Star Trek movies, it was only years after the fact that I finally began to grasp how essential the idea of the show was and what made it precious to so many people. It can scarcely be news to any of you or us that we live in a terrifying world, a world whose very survival appears to hang by a fraying thread, a world where the latest fad is killing school children. This is not a world in which I think it's kind of easy to exist. No wonder we spend so much time amusing ourselves to death in a trivial or insubstantial escapism. Video games, men in spandex, or cell phones. So-called superheroes, saints for a, for a secular society. Mickey Mouse and Superman head the pantheon of gods because mere heroes no longer suffice. What I have recently come to understand is that Star Trek, on a more sophisticated level than Batman, for example, provides what is perhaps a more plausible optimism than Superman. It attempts to show a world where humankind can improve without superheroes to save them where the definition of progress isn't that just because we can do something, it doesn't follow that we must do it. Technology must not become the tail wagging the human dog. Just because we can blow ourselves to smithereens, it does not follow that we must blow ourselves to smithereens. That men and women are capable of learning from past mistakes. In a controversial word of evolving, Star Trek arguably doesn't promise superpowers, but it does hold out the promise of realizing our own potential. Star Trek holds out the prospect of possibility, of the belief that human beings may never be perfect but that striving for perfection in the spirit of intelligent and humane inquiry is a legitimate and desirable goal. The final frontier turns out to be right here. Meet me there. Thank you. I'm happy to answer questions. See you, sir. I have some, yeah. I, I made a movie with Tom Hanks and John Candy called Volunteers. And uh, John was a, was a very interesting and extremely talented comedian. Um, what I was surprised by was that he was, he grew up in the Canadian provinces and his experience of a lot of stuff that, you know, if you grow up in New York, you sort of take for granted certain foods that he had never encountered or he was a very nervous flyer. Uh, these were like big things and going to Mexico, I think it was the first time he'd gone out of the country where we shot volunteers. So he was always kind of, rolling with punches. What I do remember, I'll just tell you one story. There's a scene between him and Tom Hanks in an airplane where they're talking, you probably know the scene I'm talking about. We rehearsed it on folding chairs in Los Angeles and Tom could never get through the scene without cracking up because John was just so hilarious. And I thought, well, that will, you know, six months from now, when we're sitting on an airplane, and, you know, we'll be past that. No. <laughs> <laughs> I had to shoot it in, in, in sections. 
because Tom was biting the inside of his cheek so hard not to keep cracking up while Candy was doing his thing. He was a nice man. Yes? Oh, uh, Uh, I was just wondering, there's a lot of um, appreciation for the Jerry Bolton score for the original Star Trek motion picture. It is amazing and utterly brilliant score. But followed by James Horner's for your movie, I'm wondering how did you feel when you saw the cut that had his score included? Because it perfectly captures that nautical sense that you, I think, were aiming for. About the James Horner score? Yes. Well, you know, our, our movie was made on the cheap first movie right, was $45 million and the script kept changing and I, I heard these stories, the actors saying, did you get the 430 changes? <laughs> wow. yeah. um, we didn't have the money to hire Jerry Goldsmith, so I had to go looking for other people and in those days writers or composers would submit cassettes. You'd drive around LA or whatever and just be listening to these cassettes. And I found there was a kind of depressing sameness to a lot of the music. It all was sort of generic movie music or generic space music or something. And um, my editor, who was also listening, said, take a listen to this. And that was James. And I said, okay, this is different. Uh, and so I sat down with James, and it was like, you know, when you meet people, you're working on a movie, when actors meet the director, the first thing they want to know is, is he crazy? <laughs> <laughs> Am I going to live? <laughs> Do I have to drag the boat over the mountain? <laughs> <laughs> and so composers and actors, you know, the, the composers meeting, and, he doesn't know me, I don't know him, so we're doing this after you, Alphonse, routine. Finally, we began to understand that we both had the same rather dry sense of humor. Um, and I explained to him, I said, submarines are what we're talking about here, and the ocean. I want you to think WC, I want you to think La Mer. I have an advantage talking about you, I have an, it's an advantage and it's a disadvantage because I'm musically knowledgeable. My mother was a concert pianist, my sister teaches violin, my grandfather was in the Boston Symphony. I grew up with it. I can, I can talk that language. Uh, not so much, but I could, I could invoke WC or later with Cliff Eidelman, I could invoke Stravinsky, Firebird, and, and communicate. Um, so I said La Mer. And uh, he went away and you know, wrote a little something, and I said, yeah, this is gonna work fine. And we had a great experience together. We did three movies. Uh, and we used to just sit around and listen to music at his place a lot of time, introduce each other pieces we might not know. Um, when I worked with Miklos Roja, who had done, you know, Ben Hur, King of Kings, El Cid, Spellbound, Asphalt, Jungle, Bruce Force, Ivanhoe, Knights of the Round. I thought that was my first movie. I thought, am I going to have anything intelligent to say here to this guy? Um, and it turned out I had like two things to say. It was a big deal. Um, so that was my experience with with James Horner, and of course by the time we got to Star Trek VI, we couldn't afford him either. <laughs> which, is, which is how I discovered Cliff. Yes? So when you made The Wrath of Khan, you were obviously early in your directing career, and you were very early in your exposure and involvement with Star Trek. Looking back now, now over the years, and all of your experience you've amassed, both in Star Trek and just in general, is there a scene or are there scenes in The Wrath of Khan that looking back, knowing what you know now, that you would have done differently? Oh, absolutely. 
I mean, looking at movies you've directed is like looking at home movies of your life. You know, and time after time, I said, why didn't you go closer? You know, because I, I didn't know what I was doing. I was just learning stuff, and I thought, if you keep the actors in focus and the script is really strong, you'll be okay, which in a way is true. Um, assuming you have a good, strong script and you're getting good performances. But yes, there's a lot of things you look at, and I'm not the only one. I heard, I was living in London, and I went to an auditorium where David Lean was being interviewed. And the interviewer says, gosh, the end of the bridge on the River Kwai, madness, madness, what a great movie. He says, I hate that movie. <laughs> And we're all going, you, you, you hate that moment? Why, why do you hate the moment? And he says, because after I shot the close-up of James Donald going madness, madness, Sam Spiegel put the guy on a plane back to London and it's a double who walks away. And he didn't like the way the double was swinging his arms at the end of the movie. So you're not, you're, you're not alone. I mean, I saw Betty Davis on television doing a tribute to Willie Wyler, Lifetime Achievement Award. And they'd been lovers for, been made four movies and whatever. And it was supposed to be a tribute. And she started remembering an argument they had over a line reading in the letter. And they got, and got angrier and angrier. Last story, because it's such a killer. I met Paul Henry. I met him outside the academy on Wilshire Boulevard, staying on the pavement. Somebody introduced me and I said, gosh, that's the only business where you get to shake hands with your dreams. And I said, I mean, I just think you're so great in so many movies, but I have to tell you, when you tell the band to play La Marseillaise in Casablanca, I fall to pieces. He goes, I hate that moment. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, you, 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 hate, you hate the moon? Why do you hate the moon? He said, because, and this is like in public, we're standing on a sidewalk. He says, the moment I say, play La Marseillaise, the band all goes like this. And I say to Cortez, the director, where, 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 where are the guys? He says, well, we'll cut to a shot of Bogey on the stairs, and you'll give him the high sign, it's okay to play. He says, wait a minute, I'm Victor Laszlo. I'm leader of the resistance in the free world and I can't get the band at the ass under of nowhere to play the Montreal. Well, they check with the barkeep. It's absurd. Cortez <laughs> <laughs> says, yeah, but then Bogey has nothing to do. He says, not my problem with the Bogey. He's getting angrier and angrier on the sidewalk four in the afternoon. And I'm like saying, there's earthquakes in California, right? When is there one when we could use one? I don't care if the ground opened up and swallowed him or me. I, I that's, that's actors, you know, and directors looking at their stuff. And by the way, in Star Trek, you have this thing called director's edition, the director's cut. The director's cut is rarely better than the finished original movie. Maybe Walter Murch's Touch of Evil revisions that winds up being a better movie. But most of the time, they're always longer, but they're not really better. Does anybody really want people watching Close Encounters to go on board the spaceship? And you're, you're not leaving things to our imagination. It was longer, but once in a while, in Star Trek VI, I had this happen, where I thought, gee, when Valeris is naming the conspirators during what I call the waterboarding scene, which is not a comfortable scene to watch anymore, um, we should cut to the faces of the people. Otherwise, she's just naming names in the audience that they remember. So in the so-called director's edition, which otherwise I think is exactly the same, I put in cuts to the, the, the people who are the conspirators, just to help. But I didn't want them to advertise it as a director's cut. So I think it's called a special edition or something. Yes? Generally speaking, William Shatner 
is known in the Star Trek community as one that's self-centered, that always wants things his way. And Leonard Nimoy was the one who was always forgiving and, and kind to others. But in your book, you expose some aspects of Leonard Nimoy that most people haven't heard of, whereas he was demanding on certain close-up shots and he was very argumentative on certain things that the way that were done. So do you think there's a little bit more of William Shatner and Leonard Nimoy that the average person is not seeing that you saw firsthand, even more so than was it you exposed in your book? I think people are complicated uh, and making sweeping generalizations about uh, Shatner or Nimoy or anybody else, it, it turns out that well, people are fallible, we can be bad-tempered, you have no idea what's going on. Everybody connected with Star Trek writes a memoir. <laughs> and so whenever I'm in a bookstore, you remember bookstores. <laughs> um, and, I, and I see a Star Trek memoir, I immediately go to the index to see how I, how I come out. <laughs> and so I, so I looked up Leonard's memoir and I found that during his death scene, he was very angry at me because I came to film the dress scene dressed as Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. Uh-huh. I've never dressed as Sherlock Holmes in my life. <laughs> never. And so what was he misremembering? What he was misremembering was that I was wearing a suit. And I was wearing a suit because when we wrapped, I was going to the opera. And in those days, when you went to the opera, you put on a suit. But it's just, it is, you know, and he was, I think, feeling very ambivalent about shooting his death scene. It's, he was suddenly having second thoughts about the whole thing. So he, he was testy. Um, anybody, you know, I'm Bill, they all, they all had their strong points and their, you know, these are, a bunch of people, remember when you're talking about Star Trek, these people were working actors who had been in various television shows and this and that, and the fickle finger of fate in the form of Gene Roddenberry had gone, you, 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 and suddenly they were yoked together like Siamese quintuplets for like the rest of their lives. The best Star Trek movie is Galaxy Quest. <laughs> Yes. On a little bit lighter note. I thought that was lighter. <laughs> well, uh, I know this is not having to do with his chest, but um, with, with the Colonel Mamba, there are a few photos floating around on the internet taken on the set of CD Alpha 5 where he is laughing his ass off because someone has sent one of those little inflatable robot oh, yeah. toys onto the set with a picture of Herr Benetrev's face pasted on it. <laughs> and remember, was somebody off camera saying, Buzz, Buzz, the Starship, the Starship? <laughs> I, I, the short answer to that is I don't. You're talking about events which as of today seem to be at least 40 years ago or more. <laughs> and I, I found out, by the way, that my memory, I have a very good memory, but it ain't perfect. And people, well, you made my previous point. Anyway, I, I, um, people said, you know, did you, did you work with Gene Roddenberry? And I said, no. You know, I met him when we did Star Trek II. We, we sort of kissed the ring, but, but he wasn't part of making the movie. And then I was back at my alma mater, the University of Iowa, where they had my papers. And there, to my consternation, was a exhibit of memoranda between me and Gene Roddenberry. Toxic, I might add, about how much he hated it. Every Star Trek script I ever worked on, he didn't like. Um, and I'm not the most diplomatic person. He's not the most diplomatic person. So it's interesting to read this stuff, which I had completely blotted out. I just didn't remember. So I'm giving you the, the best memories I have with the caveat that 
they may be incorrect, they may be imperfect. Yes, yes uh, to leave Star Trek for a moment, um, I'm a big fan of your, your editing uh, discovered Dr. Watson's manuscripts. At last. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I was wondering if you ever would edit the unpublished uh, stories of Edward Malone as uh, regards Professor Challenger's mm. adventures. Now that you mention it. Oh. <laughs> that sounds like a very cool idea. <laughs> that sounds like a very cool idea. I'm actually working on another Holmes book, so if I'm still standing in a year, uh, maybe I'll get to that. Good idea. Yeah. I wanted to ask you a question of my own about uh, the seven percent solution. I enjoyed reading in your memoir about that uh, Sigmund Freud in the movie, in this in the novel and in the movie, is based more on your father than on Sigmund Freud. And I thought that was fascinating. Well there's an uh, it, it's, there's an element of truth to it. My father was a psychoanalyst, and, I, and the book took shape because he was a psychoanalyst. I was about 11 when he gave me the Sherlock Holmes stories to read, and there's 60 of them, and I wolfed them down, and then I was sad that the, there were, were no more. I'm not the first person who had gone through that. Um, but when I was in high school, people would say to me, oh, your old man's a shrink, is he a Freudian? And I, I didn't know. So I said, Pop, are you a Freudian? And he's, are you now or have you ever been? Uh, <laughs> and he said, um, it's a silly question. And I said, why? Why is it silly? He said, because it's no more possible to discuss the history of psychoanalysis and not start with Freud then you can discuss the history of the discovery of America by Western you know, Europe without starting with Columbus or the Vikings would take your pick. But to suppose that nothing has happened since Columbus is to be pretty rigid, pretty doctrinaire. When a patient comes to see me, I listen to what they say. I listen to how they say it. I'm very interested in what they don't say. I'm interested in what they're wearing, whether they're on time, what their body language is. I am, in short, searching for clues from them as to why they are not happy. And I said, gee, that sounds like detective work that you do. And he said, well, it is like detective work in a way. I thought this light bulb went off in my 12-year-old head because I suddenly realized who Sherlock Holmes had always reminded me of. He reminded me of my dad. And then I went from there to wondering how much did Arthur Conan Doyle know about the life and writing of Sigmund Freud? And the first thing you realize is, okay, they're both doctors. They both died in the same town, within nine years of each other. And they both were involved with cocaine. <laughs> Freud was a user for a time, and Holmes is a user. Um, and so over the next 10 years, because I said it earlier in this show, if you were paying attention, I am a slow thinker. <laughs> <laughs> so I was 26 years old before I sat down to write what became the 7% solution. And yes, inevitably, a lot of my father's, and the other thing my father said about Floyd that stuck with me and probably influenced the characterization. He said, you have to understand that Sigmund Freud's claim to genius does not rest on any theory that he ever articulated. They could all be wrong. I said, how can that be? If, if all his theories are wrong, what's his claim to genius? And my dad said, <laughs> Sigmund Freud was the first non-artist to set foot on a hitherto unchartered and unknown continent called the unconscious. And if his maps of that land are subsequently shown to be in error, 
does anybody really remember or care that Columbus thought he was in India? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, my since then I've you know learned lots and lots of stuff about Freud and read lots of biographies and working on other shows about him and stuff. Because he's an interesting person to me. Yes. Uh, I got this a microphone racing your way even as we speak. Old guy running. <laughs> On the 7% solution, um, there's that one scene with the uh, killer horses. I seem to remember reading that you had planned for it to be darker, so you didn't see the guys holding the reins. Well, that's another thing we could now get rid of. We could fix it. Yes, please. I, I'm the person, sidebar, and by the way, I see a lot of people yawning. We can call a halt for this anytime. Um, I am the person who restored and rescued the African Queen. The African Queen was unavailable on DVD, and I wanted a DVD of it. And then I found out that it was all entangled with legal stuff with Sam Spiegel and the Romulus brothers. And it took me six years. It took six years, three years to disentangle it legally and six years to restore the negatives. Because remember, Technicolor film is three pieces of film yeah. running through the camera. And in the printing process, it's lithography. You, you glue them all together. And Technicolor has the agreeable sensation of that they could never get them to line up 100%. So it was always kind of romantic looking. But it also obscured things that you weren't meant to see anyway. So when they when you do digital, you can line up those three pieces of film 100%. And you may see stuff you don't want to see. Like Judy Garland having acne when she's singing over the rainbow in sepia. It's, it's wrong, and they, and they didn't compensate for it when they were doing that draft of the CD, uh, DVD. But the African Queen, it all worked for us. Because they were really in Africa. And Bogart said to the cinematographer, you see this face? It's taken me a long time to get this face. Why are you fucking with this face and making me look like we had a freak out or anything? Um, <laughs> so it's you you when they go down the waterfall in the African Queen, in the original version, and I'm not in favor of tampering with movies. I'm not in favor of cutting out embarrassing moments. Because movies are history. And you, you have to be careful of that. But if you can clean up the sound, or if you can get rid of a wire, then I think that, to me, that's kind of a legit thing. Because that the movie would want to be without that wire. And certainly the lip designers without the wires and the train would be better. No question. You've spoken at length about how many takes you had Mr. Shatner do in order to do. Here it comes. How many takes did he use to do the con screen? <laughs> oh, you, mean here this, we go. you mean this screen right here? <laughs> yeah, that screen, right. Um, to be honest, I, I don't remember. I don't suspect it was a lot. I think one of the things that a lot of people don't get when he's doing that screen is that he's acting. He knows they're going to be rescued. He's figured that out already. But Khan doesn't know it. And so the screen is not, you know, the actor being hammy or over the top. He's playing to a different audience. All the way at the back. All the way. Yeah, oh, one, sorry. One, one, the tiny bit of minutia, and perhaps you just want to take just a few seconds to answer. I don't know how many people would be interested. It's something that you alluded to when I was getting a, a poster autograph from you earlier. Why Bob Peake's beautiful, beautiful artwork uh, was not used domestically. Uh, and you said there's a story behind that, so if you'll. Oh, the, the story was merely that by the time Khan was finished, 
we were so down to the wire and they were figuring out things so much at the last minute that they didn't really have time to do the most creative, I mean the original con poster is sort of a all over the map type thing and I guess the public hadn't really settled on the fact that the star of the movie is gone. You know, and at that point the, you, things get revised. And it happens in TV series all the time. It's, you know, it's an ensemble piece, but one actor kind of rises to the surface and, you know, hey, Spock, that's the one we glom onto for whatever reason. Um, so yeah, it just wasn't done in time. Yes, so the way back. So you mentioned that you got to see those like four or five drafts of the scripts before they sent them on the list, effectively 80% of your script. What was the, what, what in the scripts really shown through? Like what was the point of contention that you probably so many drafts that, that uh, was holding them up? That you well, they were all on different topics. They, they, they wasn't the same script. It was just an attempt to get another Star Trek movie. And I, I don't remember them very well. I do remember at some point people singing happy birthday to Spock and Vulcan. And I thought, no, we just can't. <laughs> um, there was a simulator sequence, which was on page 30 of some draft. Spock wasn't in it. That was, that was, I made what I thought was a joke because we were working on the movie and we hadn't started shooting yet. But uh, I was sitting behind Harv Bennett in the screening room and we were looking at special effects test shots. And I think one of us had gotten a letter that morning, if Spock dies, you die. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. So, I'm sitting, and we were talking about the simulator, and I was sort of talking to myself. And I said, Joe, you should kill the fucker off in the first scene. <laughs> <laughs> and Harv whirled around and he goes, that is genius. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how he wound up in the first scene. I, I thought I was being silly, it's which I specialize in, yes. Go ahead. Oh, all right, one there, one there, okay. The day after was such an impactful series. When, when you were making that, did you have any idea of the scope of the influence that was going to have on the world? The short answer is no. Um, I wound up doing the day after I was the third director asked to do it. Nobody wanted to do it, including me. Who wanted to make a movie about nuclear war? I was having a good time. Nobody wants to think about nuclear war. We know it's it's there. By the way, it's it's more there right now than it was back then. But anyway, uh, I was being psychoanalyzed. At the time, I was in my 30s, and I was living cliche, lying on a couch. And my, my shrink never spoke. You do all the heavy lifting and formal analysis. And now he spoke. And I'm sitting there, lying there, trying to talk my way out of doing the movie. And he said, well, I think this is where we find out who you really are. <laughs> so then I realized I had to do the movie. And I jawboned a lot of people into the movie with that line. My cinematographer, Game Rescher, on Star Trek II, who also was the cinematographer on A Face in the Crowd, which is maybe the oh, greatest American oh, yeah. film, um, he didn't want to do it. You know, he said, no, don't, and I said, wait, let me get this straight. The one time this town gives you the chance to put your work in the service of your beliefs, you're gonna pass and bitch at dinner parties? I think this is where we find out who you really are. <laughs> anyway, so, um, I'm afraid I've lost track of your question, but um, I had no idea. In fact, my initial position was, this will never get on the air. I said that to ABC. Nothing like this has ever been seen on network television. 
you guys make the flying nun or something like that, and then this isn't going to happen. And they said, oh, yes, it will. And of course, by the time it happened, it almost didn't happen, because the whole country was up in arms about it. People were calling me a traitor in the New York Post. Uh, and uh, when I watched it, when it finally went on TV in October 1983, I was sitting there with my then fiance. There were no commercials because all the sponsors had fled one of no part of it. And I said to her, I said, if this were not my film, do you think you'd be sitting through it? Because I don't. <laughs> and then the next morning to find out that a hundred million people had seen it in one night, which is the old time, it will never be equal because there's too many channels, so I win. <laughs> uh, I was totally amazed. Just was, you know, it, was, it helped that we were banned in Boston. You know, when people start saying, "Don't look at something, don't see something," then we all want to. Look. Anyway, there was somebody over there. I had a corporate office job at that time, and it was the water cooler, quote unquote, conversation movie. It's too bad we don't have a water cooler conversation. We're so yeah. separate now. Oh, Everybody's yeah, yeah. in their own place listening to their earbuds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would have been heavy water. you with the yeah. question? Here you are. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> Confessions of a Homie Pigeon is one of my favorite novels. And I remember in the 80s or 90s, you had talked about in an interview that it had been optioned. Christopher Reeve was attached to it. What happened with that? I don't remember Christopher. Uh, I wrote a novel called Confessions of a Homing Pigeon, uh, which was a sort of semi autobiographical novel about growing up and or trying to grow up. Uh, and it was optioned to be made into a film, and they wrote a screenplay. Most screenplays, most movies do not get made. Pauline Kale said that Hollywood is the only town where you can die from encouragement. <laughs> uh, and I don't know, the first 500 times this sort of thing happened, I would just get very upset and go to bed. And over the years, I've grown a thicker hide. And I've also learned that things can disappear for eight years and then sort of come back. I did a Philip Roth movie uh, based on his novella, The Dying Animal, which I wasn't going to call The Dying Animal. I think it was going to pass the Saturday night test. Hey, hun, want to go see The Dying Animal? <laughs> so, I, so I called it Elegy. It was Penelope Cruz and Ben Kingsley. It's a really good movie. Um, and I wrote the script, and I didn't hear anything about it for like five, six years, and then one of the phone rings and they say, guess what, We're, the movie's going to be made. So if you live long enough, maybe some of them get made. <laughs> so I, I, I'm going to, you know, it's a terrible death to be talked to death. That's, that's bad. So I'll, I'll take three more questions, and then I think we should wrap this up while you all have the best years of your life. <laughs> <laughs> while, while, while I'm on the way back, I'd like to ask, because there are a lot of Sherlock Holmes uh, redos going on in the last few years. Are there any that you've liked? I loved the first two seasons of the Benedict Cumberbatch. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Um, most of the time, I really like reading Doyle or my imitations of Doyle better than a lot of others. Uh, uh, I don't pretend to be objective about it. But I hated Basil Rathbone and Nigel, which just fucking hated it. Uh, I, I never understood why a genius hangs out with a jerk. And I never believed that Nigel Bruce was the Dr. Watson whose voice is in those stories. When I wrote The 7% Solution, it was a kind of a protest against those kind of movies. There are movies, there are Sherlock Holmes movies that I like, besides mine. I like the Without a Clue one, I think it's hilarious. <laughs> and Holmes is the dummy and, and Watson is the smart one. Um, I love the Billy Wilder one, The Private Life of. Um, 
And I like the Peter Cushing on the bathroom, oh, yeah. it's pretty good. But otherwise, I like to go back to the well. Anyway. I'm going to put this question for him in the weeks. A crock or a bum bum, and what? This was Klingon. Was this Klingon? A crock or a bum bum? I can't hear what you are. Uh, I can't Krapa. hear. Crock bum. Crock is a scuff hostage. Oh. <coughs> Oh, are you talking about Kreplach? Kreplach. Oh, say Kreplach, man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or Wonton. Which do you prefer? Wonton. Wonton. And why? That's the way I was raised. <laughs> You're Jewish, Sunday night, Chinese. would you give to somebody, well, fandom and stuff where we all get tied up and know things are not going right, but you've seen like different interpretations of Sherlock Holmes and stuff. Is there any kind of advice as to how maybe a fan should kind of approach different approaches to what they consider, oh, this is my fandom, this is my thing, I don't like people changing. Well, I'll say two things and I, I hope they're useful. One is, the, the entire history of art is a history of cut and paste. It's all spin-offs of spin-offs. The, uh, the Odyssey is a fanboy spin-off of the Iliad. It just is. And the Aeneid is a fanboy spin-off of the Odyssey. So there's always, it's always about adding. Mozart reorchestrated Handel's Messiah. And by the way, Thomas Beecham reorchestrated it later. They're always making it bigger and bigger and whatever. Um, so I think one has to understand that this stuff rolls with the, it comes with the territory. Um, movies are like souffles. They either rise or they don't, and half the time you don't know why. When I went to work on Star Trek and people said, weren't you intimidated? I said, no, I wasn't, because I didn't know anything about it. So I just like remade it in a way that made sense to me. Or I knew that my dad was going to see the movie. He didn't know what Star Trek was. So I put in the 23rd century at the beginning so he would know. And then I kept translating it into submarines because I, I like movies about submarines. By the way, it was like, 35 years later, before I realized the movie that really influenced me was The Enemy Below, how many people have seen it? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Who knows who directed The Enemy Below? No, that's Dick Run Powell. Silent Run Deep. Dick Powell. Dick Powell. Dick Powell directed The Enemy yeah. Below. Very good. That's my favorite trivia question. <laughs> good place to end, maybe. <laughs> Well, we thank you for joining us. After a break, you're going to be back down in the nonsense. Yeah, all right. I'll, I'll, I'll try to sell more of my books. You bet. Yeah, well, I returned the Pharaoh. So, thanks. It's wonderful. I read it. I loved it. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you.